Great. So welcome everybody this Saturday morning uh, to the Saturday seminar series hosted by the Department of Physics at Washington University in St. Louis. It's a series we've been doing for about, I think, 30 years now uh, at this point uh, with roughly six lectures per semester. And this semester we are highlighting a series of talks uh, talking about the research being done in, at the McDonald Center for the Space Sciences. First starting off with a series of talks covering astrophysics and cosmology, and then later this semester in November doing a series of talks on planetary science. So this morning, uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Johanna Nagy uh, talking to us. Johanna has been an assistant professor at the Department of Physics for the past two years now. Prior to that, uh, she did her graduate work at Case Western University in experimental cosmology before taking up a Dunlop Fellowship at the University of Toronto, where she considered, continued her research into experimental uh, cosmology. Johanna uh, is part of the legacy here at Washington University of doing experimental work using balloons uh, at or near the South Pole. Uh, but now bringing new detector technologies and new areas of research into cosmology with these balloon experiments. And uh, she recently has been awarded a NASA grant to develop a new set of detectors and uh, balloon experiment to look at the earliest light from the universe. And that will be happening in a few years and we will hopefully hear about that uh, today. So, uh, We'll start her talk in a moment, but first I'd like to remind people, uh, please uh, keep your Zoom sessions on mute. I will try to keep track of that. We will also uh, take questions at the end of the talk. And so I'll be looking uh, in both the chat or raise your hand. Uh, I will be looking uh, for questions. So with that, uh, Johanna, uh, please start. Great. Thanks so much. And um, my screen looks good, hopefully. You can see my title slide. Yeah, it looks great. Great. So yeah, thank you so much, Mike, for the introduction. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joining us this Saturday morning. So today I'm excited to talk to you about how we use microwave telescopes to measure the oldest light in the universe. And so first I'll tell you um, a little bit about this light and why it's so special. And then I'll talk about the telescopes that we use to measure it and how we build them. And so uh, today I also have a couple of trivia questions mixed in along the way. So when we get to that point, I'll let you know how you can play along. Um, and I really hope that you'll choose to participate. So just to jump right in and to explain the title of my talk, um, the oldest light that we can observe today is leftover from when the universe was only about 375,000 years old. So before that time, the universe was very hot and very dense. And it was filled with a plasma of particles that were constantly interacting with each other. So the photons, um, which are particles of light, were just constantly bouncing around. But then the universe was also expanding. And so this plasma was becoming an ordinary gas. And so this light started to bounce around less and less. And eventually, most of these photons could travel for the next 13 billion years without ever running into another particle. And so that's why we see these photons today in what we call the cosmic microwave background. And because I've experienced most of the history of the universe, these photons are then a really powerful tool for us to learn about its structure and evolution. So if your eyes could see microwave radiation and you looked up at the sky, you would see a uniform glow that would look like this. It wouldn't be red, it would be some microwave color, but it would look pretty much the same everywhere. And so this is the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is what we call the CMB for short. So everywhere that you look in the sky, you would see the universe glowing with this temperature of about 2.7 Kelvin, um, which is about negative 455 degrees Fahrenheit. But then if you zoom in a little bit more and you make even more sensitive measurements of the microwave light, then you start to see these really small differences in temperature. So these differences are less than one part in a thousand. And this image is a real measurement of the microwave sky that was made by an experiment um, called PLOMP, which was a satellite experiment. And so these tiny temperature variations might just look like noise in the measurement, but they're actually real features on the sky. 
And so it's by using the information in these really tiny variations that we can actually learn about the structure and the composition of the universe. And so the way that we do that is by performing statistical analysis on the features that we see. And so this helps us understand how much power there is in features of a certain size. So we can take our map of the sky, of the microwave sky, and then we can press it into a plot that tells us how much of these features or blobs um, deviate from the average for a certain size. And so the biggest blobs are characterized by the left side of the plot, and then they get smaller as you move towards the right. And this is interesting because we can make models of the universe that predict what these features in this plot should look like in different scenarios. And so then we can see how changing the structure of the composition of the universe would change those patterns that we measure. So here's a plot that's showing an actual measurement of the temperature fluctuations in the CMB. Um, and this is, again, what these uh, fluctuations look like as a function of the blob size. And this measurement, again, comes from the Planck satellite. So it's based on that map that I just showed you. And so the data points are shown here in red. And then the green solid curve is showing you um, our best theoretical model that fits these points. And so the parameters in this model are telling us about the structure and the composition of the universe. And so my talk today is going to be mostly focused on how we make measurements like the red points. But if you're interested in learning more about how we do simulations to make models of the universe, then I encourage you to join us next Saturday um, for a Saturday science talk by Professor Jim Mertens, because he's going to talk all about um, theoretical cosmology and the computer modeling that we do so that we can understand how to compare these measurements to our models of the universe. So as we move into talking about how we measure the cosmic microwave background, I just want to be really explicit about what microwaves are. So we use the word microwave to refer to a particular type of light. And actually most of what we know today about astrophysics and cosmology has come from looking at light. And we're really fortunate that we're not just limited to the light that we can see with our own eyes, which is in the part of the spectrum that we call visible light. So we have access to the entire electromagnetic spectrum that's shown here. And humans have gotten really good at uh, using different types of light for everything from listening to the radio to taking um, medical images with x-rays. And so last week, Professor Mike Novak talked about using different types of light in tests of general relativity. So everything from doing radio interferometry to image black holes um, to getting measurements of really high energy x-ray sources. So today, what we're talking about is the light that's in this microwave part of the spectrum. And since light's a wave, um, we can talk about its wavelength. And for the microwaves that we're interested in today, that ranges from about one to 20 millimeters. And alternatively, we can talk about the frequency of the light. So this is how fast the waves oscillate. And um, for the CMB, that's something like roughly tens to hundreds of gigahertz. Okay, so this brings me to my first trivia question of the day. And so here's how this works. Very shortly, I'm going to launch a poll through Zoom and you'll get a little pop-up window on your screen. So that pop-up window will have this question with some multiple choice answers. And you can then click on your favorite answer and click submit. And that will send me an anonymous response. And of course, these are just for fun. So you're welcome to take a wild guess at the answer. And then um, once the answers have come in, we'll take a look at the results. And if you'd rather not play along, that's okay too. You don't have to submit an answer. You'll still get to see the results. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what percentage of the photons in the universe today are part of the CMB? So photons are these particles of light and using many different types of telescopes, we can see photons across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So some of these come from objects um, like stars and galaxies, but some of them are part of this background glow of the universe. And so I'm just asking you to guess how many. And so I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll right now. Okay, so go ahead and vote if you'd like. And I'm starting to see votes coming in already. That's great. And if you're having technical problems or you can't vote for whatever reason, that's okay too. You can, you'll still get to see the results in the end. So I'm going to give a little bit more time for answers to come in.
but great. This is fun. I'm getting to watch the answers come in in real time. I'm going to give like 10 more seconds or so if you haven't submitted yet, you'd like to. So go ahead and take a guess. Okay, and it looks like most people have been able to vote, so that's great. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and end my poll. And now I'm going to share the results with you. So hopefully you can see the results um, in a little plot that's up on the screen, yeah? And so it looks like actually all of these answers were pretty popular. So we have a pretty even race here. Um, there are lots of different guesses. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you the answer. Um, so the answer is that um, more than 99% of the photons or answer E are part of the CMB. So I'm gonna stop sharing our poll results. Uh, but so this is the vast majority of the photons in the universe today are actually part of the CMB. And it turns out that the average cubic centimeter of space, which is roughly the volume of a sugar cube, has about 410 CMB photons in it. So if you're like me and you want to measure these photons, that's really good news that there are lots of them out there. <laughs> but on the other hand, um, it's only a small fraction of the energy density of the universe that's even in the form of light. And these signals that we're looking for now are actually really faint. So even though these CMB photons are so abundant, it's still not an easy measurement. So to make it even harder, we're actually interested in measuring a property of the light that's called the polarization. And so this has to do with the orientation of the electromagnetic wave. So you might be familiar with this if you have a pair of polarized sunglasses. Um, so these have a special filter that blocks light with a certain polarization so that they can block out glare, but then they still let other light through with a different polarization so that you can still see. And so it turns out the CMB is also polarized and so most of our current CMB research is focused on measuring this polarization. Um, and the signals that we're looking for in polarization are about a thousand times fainter than those small temperature fluctuations that I showed you earlier. So it's actually really hard to detect. But the reason that we're doing this is that because by measuring this polarization, we can actually learn a lot of new things about the universe. So for instance, we aren't really sure what was happening in the universe when it was much less than one second old. Um, this is well before the CMB was emitted, because you remember the CMB was emitted when the universe was about 375,000 years old. So this is when it was much less than one second old. So we really don't know what was happening at that time. Um, but some of our most promising theories say that the early universe might have been expanding by many orders of magnitude in just a tiny fraction of a second. And so this process would generate a background of gravitational waves, which would later leave a really distinct polarization pattern in the CMB. So that's just one of the things that we're looking for when we're trying to measure the CMB polarization. Um, but CMB polarization is also generated when photons scatter from electrons, like those that would have been produced by the first stars. So CMB polarization measurements can actually tell us what the universe was like when the first stars were forming. And because CMB photons interact with matter um, through gravity, we can actually learn about how matter is distributed throughout the universe on large scales by looking at this polarization. And we can even learn about what types of particles must exist in the universe um, and how massive they are. So there are lots of different reasons why we're motivated to try and do this really hard measurement to go and measure the CMB polarization. So one of the biggest problems for us when we go to measure the CMB is that we're doing our observations from Earth. So our own Earth is embedded in our solar system, um, and that's also inside our Milky Way galaxy. And so if you've ever been far away from city lights and you look up at a really clear sky, you might be lucky enough to see the dust and the really high density of stars um, that you'd see when you look towards the center of our own galaxy. So this is what a lot of people think of when they think of the Milky Way. Um, and it's beautiful, it's really inspiring, but to cosmologists, it's also a really big problem. And that's because even though we live out in one of the spiral arms of our galaxy, um, no matter what direction we point our telescopes, we still have to look through our galaxy just a, even a little bit to see the universe beyond it. And so when we try and measure the CMB, we're also seeing our own galaxy. Um, which is also polarized at microwave frequencies. 
And so we need to be able to tell the light apart that's coming from our galaxy from the light that's coming from the CMB. And this is tricky, but we're actually able to separate the signals by looking at different frequencies of microwave light. So in addition to our own galaxy, when we're looking at the CMB, um, we also have to look through the atmosphere if we're observing from the surface of the Earth. And one reason that this is a problem is that the atmosphere glows at microwave frequencies. So how much it glows depends on where you're observing from and the weather on that particular day. So on average, the atmosphere in a place like St. Louis would be about 50 to 100 times brighter than the CMB. So St. Louis is not a great place to do these measurements, unfortunately. But if we go to some of the best sites on Earth, um, it's still more like 10 times brighter than the CMB at microwave frequencies. So it's much, much better, but it's still really bright. So you can imagine trying to look at stars during the daytime when the sky is much brighter than the things that you're trying to look at. And the problem for us is not just that the atmosphere glows, but also that the atmosphere is constantly changing. So it's producing this constant so source of noise in our measurements uh, that we then have to go filter out. So the best sites on Earth for observing the CMB tend to be both high and dry. And one of the best sites for ground-based telescopes is at the South Pole. And you may not think of it as a desert, but it actually gets very little snowfall per year. And the snow that does fall doesn't melt, so it just gradually accumulates. And that's why it looks like there's so much snow there. But in addition to being very cold, um, the South Pole is at an altitude of almost 10,000 feet. So it has very stable observing conditions for microwave telescopes. And similarly, there's the Atacama Desert in Northern Chile, and it's also very dry. Um, and the part where we would put microwave telescopes is in an elevation of about 17,000 feet. And so if you've ever spent any time at high altitudes, you might've noticed that it's harder to breathe um, when you get up there because the atmosphere is thinner. And that combined with the dryness is exactly what we're trying to exploit when we do these measurements. Um, so currently, most ground-based telescopes of observing, are observing from one of these two sites, um, the South Pole or the Atacama Desert. And logistically, these aren't the easiest places to reach since they're both very remote. And that means that actually deploying and operating these telescopes from these locations can be really challenging. Um, but they have really unique atmospheric conditions. And so for us, that really justifies the extra effort. But of course, it's even better if you can get above the atmosphere and you can do that with a satellite experiment or you can do it from a stratospheric balloon. And so there have been several satellites that have observed the CMB. And I showed you a map from one of them at the beginning of this talk. But that's a really expensive way to do these measurements. And right now we don't have any space-based microwave telescopes that are currently observing. So a different and cheaper way that we can get above the atmosphere is by flying telescopes on stratospheric balloons. These get to an altitude of about 110,000 feet. So the picture on the slide was taken by a GoPro camera that was attached to a balloon-borne CMB telescope. And from this picture looking down at the Earth, you can see it really does look like we're in space. And of course, to get a telescope into the stratosphere, it takes a giant balloon. So these balloons are inflated with helium, and you can see a diagram of an inflated balloon here on the slide. And in the background, there are some football fields and uh, also the Washington Monument for scale. And so the balloon itself has to be really light. So the entire giant balloon is made out of a plastic film that's about the same thickness as a garbage bag. But even with this giant balloon, the, the maximum weight for an experiment is only about 6,000 pounds, um, which sounds like a lot, but it's really not for these telescopes. And uh, these telescopes also have to carry uh, pretty much all of their own power and operate nearly autonomously. Um, so for balloon-borne telescopes, it's really good that we can get above the atmosphere, but our telescopes have to be much smaller um, and they have much less power than the types of telescopes we would put on the ground. And unfortunately, these stratospheric balloons um, don't stay up for very long. So currently, the longest flights we can get uh, launch from McMurdo Station in Antarctica, and they stay up for an average about, of about a few weeks as they fly around the continent. 
So even though the lower atmospheric emission makes it possible for us to get more sensitive measurements than if we were observing with a telescope on the ground, we don't get to observe for quite as long. Um, but NASA has also been developing a new type of balloon. And by launching these balloons from New Zealand, um, they can circle the earth and they've demonstrated flights that can last up to a few months. So this is something that we're hoping to take advantage of in the future when the longer flight times and this different flight path will actually help us make more sensitive measurements. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you more about how we actually build these telescopes. Uh, but first I have another trivia question for you. So my question is of the items in this list, which is the coldest? So I'm going to launch the poll right now. So you should see that pop up. And so your choices are um, the South Pole, the cosmic microwave background radiation that we observe today, the sensors we use on our cameras to observe it, or maybe you just have a particularly cold-hearted boss. So go ahead and vote for your favorite answer. And I'll give you a few seconds. I see votes are starting to come in. Good, I see most people have voted. I'll give you a few more seconds here before I reveal um, what people chose. Okay, it looks like we started to level off. So I'm going to end this poll and I'm going to share the results. So everything got uh, at least one vote. I'm sorry to the person who has a really cold hearted boss. And uh, it looks like the cosmic microwave background was very popular. The next most popular answer was the sensors and our microwave cameras. So um, thanks to everyone who participated. I'm not gonna tell you the answer to this question right away. So I'm gonna stop sharing these results. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about how we build um, our telescopes. And I promise I will answer this question before uh, this talk is over today. So first I wanna tell you a little bit more about how microwave telescopes work. And when thinking about this, it's important to remember that light carries energy. So for instance, infrared heaters use light at a wavelength of about 0.01 millimeters to provide heat. And similarly, when you use a microwave oven to cook food, it works because the food is particularly efficient at absorbing this microwave energy, which then gets converted to heat. So this idea of absorbing energy from microwave light is exactly how our telescope sensors work. So to actually record data from our telescopes, we use cameras that are made out of microwave sensors. Um, and these work by absorbing the energy from the microwave photons and then they heat up very sensitive thermometers. So these thermometers are made out of special materials which are known as superconductors. And as the name suggests, when a material becomes superconducting, its electrical resistance drops to around zero. And this typically happens at very low temperatures. So as the plot on this slide is showing you, when the material is undergoing its phase transition to become a superconductor, the resistance of this material changes very strongly with temperature. So what this means is that a very small change in the temperature can lead to a relatively big change in the resistance. And this property is exactly what we rely on to make very precise measurements. So we're actually using these materials that are in their superconducting transition as uh, our thermometers. And these types of sensors are known as bolometers and they typically operate at very cold temperatures to keep the, the noise low. And so the detectors that we're currently developing for CMB experiments operate at 0.1 Kelvin. So that makes them colder than both the South Pole and the CMB. And so that's the answer to our trivia question. So here's how um, we actually make these uh, microwave sensors because it's actually a pretty complicated process. So our modern telescopes are using tens of thousands or even more of these detectors. So we can't fabricate them just one by one. So we typically make them in large arrays um, on silicon wafers at national lab facilities. And this is using um, equipment in clean rooms that's very similar to how computer chips are made. And so here's an actual picture of a detector array. 
And so this is a silicon chip. It's about six inches in diameter. And this particular detector array has 432 individual pixels. So these detectors are much bigger than the ones that would be in like a cell phone camera, but they're also measuring a much longer wavelength of light. And so we can zoom in on one of these pixels and this is what it looks like up close. So the structure in the middle is like a flat antenna and then the fins are pointing in different directions um, because they pick up different polarizations of light. And then after going through some filters on this chip, the signals travel along um, the traces to the detectors, which are located in the small whitish rectangles that are off to the side. So this particular pixel has four detectors on it, and that's because it's measuring two different polarizations of light at two different microwave frequencies. So, as I said, um, in order to operate these sensors, we have to make them cold. And the art of making things really cold is called cryogenics. So to make things as cold as 0.1 Kelvin, you have to do it in several stages. Um, but the good news for us is that we can buy equipment from commercial vendors to do this. So there are actually companies that specialize in producing these systems, which is much easier for us than building them from scratch. So on this slide, you can see a picture of one of these types of commercial coolers. It's called a dilution refrigerator. And so it circulates um, a special helium around a closed loop to achieve these very low temperatures on the coldest stage. But you can also see um, that there are intermediate temperature stages in the picture. And I'm showing you the temperature of these stages in Kelvin on the left and in Fahrenheit on the right. And most of you are probably used to thinking about temperatures in Fahrenheit. So you might recognize 80 degrees on the top stage as being uh, somewhat close to room temperature. But then as we get colder and colder, it can be more convenient to use Kelvin to describe temperature um, as we do with the CMB. And so it might be hard to tell here, for instance, if negative 458 degrees Fahrenheit is really all that much colder than negative 452 degrees um, because they both just sound really, really cold. But um, just remember that the Kelvin scale doesn't go below zero. So it's actually a big deal as you get closer and closer to zero Kelvin. And so for these telescopes, we use the coldest stages of a refrigerator for our sensors, but we also need the intermediate temperature stages for our optics and for our electronics. And to get things cold in the first place, they have to be really well insulated. So we keep this entire um, system inside a vacuum can. And it turns out vacuum is a really good thermal insulator, which is also why fancy thermoses tend to be vacuum insulated. So to give you a sense for the scale here, here's a photo of one of my students, Angelina, who's working on this same type of cryogenic system in my lab. And so in this photo, she's standing on a ladder and she's installing some stuff on the four Kelvin stage. But of course, it's not four Kelvin in this picture, it's still warm when she's working on it. And so you can see that this is a relatively big piece of equipment. And so it's great for doing tests in our lab and it's great for using on our ground-based telescopes, but we can't fly it on a balloon. And that's because not only is this cooling system really big and heavy, uh, but it uses way too much power. So we have to run our balloon experiments with about as much power as a hair dryer uses. And this cooling system takes many, many times that. So for balloon experiments, what we do instead is to fly liquid cryogens, um, like liquid helium, in a giant tank. And so this is an example from a CMB polarization experiment called SPIDER. And it has a tank that holds about 1,200 liters of liquid helium. So that gets us all the way down to 4 Kelvin, and then we can get even colder if we lower the pressure around the helium. So we then have a special tank that's filled with more helium, that we expose to the atmosphere when we're in the stratosphere. And as I said, there's not very much atmosphere up there. So it's at very low pressure. And so that pumps on the liquid helium to get us below two Kelvin. And from there, we can use special low power refrigerators that get our detectors down to much less than one Kelvin. But the drawback of this is that these liquid cryogens are boiling off throughout the flight. And so uh, when we eventually run out, our detectors will warm up and then we can't take any more data. So this giant tank uh, might last us a few weeks, but the whole time of this tank really affects how much data that we're able to collect during a flight. 
So um, to focus the light in our microwave cameras, we can use optics like mirrors and lenses. And before I show you some pictures of these optics, which would give a way to answer to this question, um, I wanna ask our last trivia question. So my question is, which of these materials can be used to make microwave telescope lenses? And I'm going to bring up my poll here, just one second, and I'm going to launch it. Okay. So your choices are silicon, like the material that Silicon Valley is named after, diamond, like you might find in jewelry, um, acrylic, which is also called plexiglass, or Legos, like you or your kids might have played with. So pick your favorite answer, and I already am starting to see votes coming in. Great. Okay, so I think most of the votes are in now. So I'm going to end the poll and share the results with you. So it looks like all of um, the first three choices were all pretty popular, um, but diamond is actually our winner here, um, with silicon being a close second. So in order to answer this question, I'm going to show you some pictures of um, microwave lenses. So let me stop sharing these results and show you my next slide. Okay, so here are some photos of um, several different types of microwave lenses. And so you'll notice that the only material that's shown on this slide that was also in the previous list um, was silicon. So unfortunately, we don't have diamond lenses for um, our telescopes, but I don't think we could actually afford those. This would be pretty expensive. Um, so there are several different materials that we can use to make microwave lenses. The photo on top is showing you a picture of a lens that's made out of a material that's called alumina, which is an aluminum oxide. And then there's a silicon lens uh, that's being shown in the bottom row, and there's also a plastic lens that's made out of polyethylene. So which material um, that we pick for our lenses depends on uh, design questions for a telescope, like how much focusing power we need for the light, or what's the diameter of the lenses that we need for a given telescope, what's the particular microwave wavelength that we're trying to measure. And also some of these materials are just more convenient to work with than others. Um, but all of the ones shown here work, and these are all photos of real uh, lenses that have been used in real microwave telescopes. And one thing you might notice about these pictures is that none of these lenses uh, look transparent to your eyes. So they're not transparent at optical wavelengths. Um, but that's okay because the, the microwaves can still pass through them. Um, those are much longer wavelength. And for all of these materials, we have to worry about getting reflections off of the lenses. So for all of them, we apply special coatings to the surfaces of the lenses to minimize those reflections. And also when we put these lenses in our telescope, um, we actually cool them to usually about a few Kelvin. And we do that because just like we don't wanna see the glow of the atmosphere, we also need to minimize the glow from our own telescope. So we like to keep as many things uh, very cold as possible. So here's how these lenses would look um, when they're actually inside a telescope. So in this diagram, we have uh, microwave radiation that would be coming from the sky that's entering the telescope on the left side. And then it passes into the instrument. And because the optics and our sensors are very cold, um, the whole instrument is in a big vacuum can. And so the microwaves have to pass through what we call a vacuum window, which lets in the microwave light, but not any air. And so then you can see uh, the two lenses in this image, which take the light and focus it onto uh, the cold detectors. And then with the help of some electronics, these signals are then recorded on computers that are outside the vacuum vessel. And then we can later analyze the data. So just like optical telescopes can use both lenses or mirrors to focus the light, uh, microwave telescopes can too. So here's a diagram showing um, a different type of telescope. Um, this telescope is a reflecting telescope, so it also has uh, mirrors. And so in this diagram, the sky is at the top of the image, and the microwave radiation comes down and travels along the orange path. So first it hits the big mirror that's labeled M1, and then it bounces to the big mirror that's labeled M2. 
And I'm calling these big mirrors uh, because their diameter is about six meters, which is close to about 20 feet. And so after hitting the second mirror, it's been redirected towards the right side of the screen. And so the microwave radiation will enter that big white cylinder. And that big white cylinder is a vacuum vessel, um, which is holding the cold detectors. And it also has um, some lenses in there, like the ones we just looked at, to help focus the light from those mirrors onto the detectors. So here are some photos showing you um, examples of what some telescopes look like from the outside. And these two examples are just really pretty pictures of telescopes that are currently observing the sky from the South Pole. Um, although I don't work on either of these experiments. The one on the left is called the South Pole Telescope, and it has a really big mirror that's about 10 meters in diameter, which is about 33 feet. And since microwaves have a longer wavelength of light than what you can see with your eyes, we can make microwave mirrors out of machined aluminum. We don't need to have any sort of fancy glass that needs to be highly polished. And for these really um, big mirrors, we can't just make them out of a single piece of metal. So they're actually made from uh, lots of smaller panels, like you can see on the mirror in the picture. So then the picture on the other side of the slide is an instrument that's called bicep array. And it doesn't have any mirrors because it's a collection of refracting telescopes. So telescopes just with uh, lenses, like the one um, that we looked at earlier. And so you can see a person for scale in this picture. And the diameter of these lenses is about two feet, although you can't see the diameter of the lenses directly in the picture. But so that means that the bicep array lenses are uh, much smaller than the South Pole Telescope mirror. And that means the telescope images have different resolution. But that doesn't mean that the bicep array is worse. Um, it means just that the bicep array and the South Pole Telescope are optimized to make different types of CMB polarization measurements. So they use different telescope designs. So the moral of this story is just that you can't judge a microwave telescope by the size of its optics. And of course, while all of these instruments are observing the sky, we're also working on developing um, our next generation of microwave telescopes. And so we hope that this next generation will be able to start observing the sky around the end of the decade, but it takes uh, many years to design and build these telescopes. And so we want to operate um, our next generation experiment actually with a combination of both reflective and refractive telescopes that we'll be observing simultaneously. And then we'll look at all of the data um, and so then we'll be able to learn more about the universe by combining these observations. So we're calling this next generation experiment CMBS4, which stands for CMB stage four because it's like the fourth generation of uh, polarization sensitive microwave telescopes. And so it's using um, all of the technologies that we've been talking about, but with many more telescopes combined and actually many more sensors than our current generation experiment. So total we will have almost half a million sensors observing the CMB um, from sites both at Chile in the Atacama Desert and at the South Pole. And then for comparison, I also have a picture here of a current uh, balloon-borne microwave telescope that's called SPIDER. So SPIDER flew once a few years ago, and we hope to fly it again um, as soon as balloon launches resume after the pandemic's over. And so here you can see a photo that was taken just before SPIDER's first launch from Antarctica. And to get a sense for the scale, um, I put a small red box in the corner, the bottom corner, that's around a person, showing you just how big this thing is. And so, as I said before, this has to um, weigh less than 6,000 pounds because that's the maximum for a balloon. And so that's about what the structure weighs. So the frame for this telescope is made out of mostly carbon fiber um, because it's lightweight and strong. And then it's covered with metallized mylar. And so this structure is what supports the experiment as it's hanging down from the balloon. And it's also what lets us control where the telescope points as it observes the sky. And then the big object kind of in the middle of the telescope is actually our vacuum vessel, um, which is what holds our liquid helium um, and what lets us keep our detectors cold. And then you can see inside, we have about six refracting telescopes, um, each of which has two cold lenses and then also our cold detector arrays. 
So um, we're also starting to design the next generation of balloon experiment. And so right now we're working on a new project that's called Taurus. And this is a new CMB polarization telescope that would launch from New Zealand on the new type of balloon that NASA has been developing. And that's really great because it would let us see much more of the sky than we can see from Antarctica. And we've only just started to design and build it. So we don't have any pretty pictures yet. We only have our computer models. Um, but you can see our conceptual design for how this experiment would look. And um, this telescope as a future instrument would actually have even more detectors than spider. And then they would also be colder, um, which will help make us more sensitive. And we'll have an improved cryogenic system to help keep these detectors colder for longer. And with this experiment, we're focusing on measurements of CMB polarization that can't be done very well from the ground. So it's actually a combination of the balloon um, and the ground-based telescopes that will help us get a more complete picture of the universe. So to just summarize, um, as the oldest and most abundant light in the universe, the CMB or the cosmic microwave background has been an incredibly powerful tool for cosmologists. And so we map the patterns that we see in this light across the sky. And then we're able to compare that to the statistical properties um, that are predicted by our theoretical models. And this helps us learn about the structure and the composition of the universe. And so to make these measurements, we design our specialized telescopes, um, specifically looking at CMB polarization these days. Uh, and then we observe the sky from very remote sites on Earth and also from stratospheric balloons. And we're currently developing new technologies and starting to build new instruments that will allow us to make even more precise measurements um, to better understand the universe. So I just wanna thank you very much for coming to my talk this morning and for participating in all of the trivia questions. And since you answered my questions, it's only fair that I answer yours. Um, so I uh, wanna just take the rest of the time here to answer your questions. And so you can go ahead and type them into the chat or you can um, raise your hand. And I'm hoping that uh, Mike will help me here with moderating these questions. Uh, thanks, uh, Joanna, it was a fantastic talk. And in fact, we do have a lot of questions that have already come in uh, during the talk. So we can start with a question from uh, Patsy Spector. How much distortion is there when the light passes through the two mirrors prior to enter the vacuum in your detectors? Good, so we actually, when we, um, that's a really great question and it's something that we worry about a lot. So we design our mirrors uh, very, very carefully to actually minimize the distortion that we'll get on the light. Um, so we don't really, we don't wanna be changing the shape and we actually, we do a lot of measurements of the instruments too once we build our telescopes. First of all, to make sure that the mirrors that we designed are actually uh, the way that they turned out when they were fabricated. Um, and also to make sure that um, we understand exactly what the light looks like um, as we're observing the sky. So we try and keep that amount of distortion very, very low. But a, sort of a different question from the absorption that you might ask is how efficient we are when we're trying to get the photons from the sky into the telescope. So we care very much that we don't distort the light, um, but we also have to worry about uh, how efficient they are. And for us, it's not, we care much more about distortion than efficiency, except that efficiency affects um, how sensitive our measurements are. So our telescopes provide very little distortion, uh, but in terms of the efficiency, they're actually only about 40 or so percent efficient. So we do lose a lot of the photons between when they're coming from the sky to when they actually get to our detectors. But that's not all at the mirrors, it's at all of the different components along the way. We've got a question from uh, Ken Coppersmith. If you had an exact real-time plot of the CMB, uh, what time scales would you expect the CMB to change? And is that significant for your measurements? Good, so um, the CMB, first of all, the CMB has been changing over cosmic time scales, right? So the CMB, um, when it was emitted, was very, very hot. And now we see it today as, uh, this 2.7 Kelvin background. So on sort of human time scales, the changes that we see in the CMB are very, very slow compared to the other processes that are happening in the universe. So for instance, if we take measurements with our telescope today, and then we take them a year from now, 
we actually expect that the CMB won't have changed um, by a level that we can detect. And that's really important for us because one of the ways that we reduce our measurement noise is actually by taking a whole bunch of different measurements and averaging them together. So if the CMB was changing quickly, then we wouldn't be able to do that. And it also helps because if we're observing from the ground, we expect that the atmosphere is changing pretty quickly because um, you can picture like weather or clouds moving across the sky. And so that's changing on very short time scales. And so when we average our measurements together, we can sort of get rid of these effects um, from the atmosphere that might be changing very quickly and just focus on the CMB, which from our perspective, isn't really changing at all. A uh, question uh, from Robert Crow. Can you talk a bit more about the significance of the polarization in obtaining your data? Sure. So um, with this CMB polarization, um, it's telling us information about the universe that we really can't get it any other way. So looking at the temperature fluctuations um, tells us certain things about the early universe, but this polarization signal gives us um, a whole different handle on what's going on. And so there are things like the gravitational waves um, that would be predicted by inflation that I mentioned. So inflation would be this time when the uh, universe was much less than one second old, when it would have expanded by many, many orders of magnitude in just a tiny fraction of a second. And so we can't see any, um, or at least these days, we can't see imprints of these gravitational waves uh, directly in the temperature signal. So we're really driven to look for these special polarization signals. And that's just because of the way um, that the CMB photons interact with the rest of the universe. So that's one example. Um, and then there are other types of things that we can look for in the CMB that we can only see through the polarization. Right. We have uh, two related questions here uh, that maybe you can address together. So first from Galaxy S8, for the personnel structures and equipment at the South Pole, how are the logistical ha challenges handled? And uh, then below that, we have a question from Elizabeth Zellman. Uh, do the Antarctic telescopes and equipment and people have an effect on melting of the southern ice cap? Ah, okay, good. So uh, first of all, so in order to be able to operate these telescopes at remote sites, uh, we do need a lot of support. And so for both um, the telescopes observing from the ground at the South Pole and the telescopes launching from balloons from McMurdo Station, um, we have support from the National Science Foundation, which operates the United States Antarctic Program. So they're able to provide all of the logistic support for us. So they help us figure out how to actually get the equipment down there. They help us figure out how to get the people down there. And once we're down there, they make sure that we're fed and that um, we uh, have a place to sleep. And they even uh, loan us big, heavy parkas to wear so we won't be cold while we're working down there. Um, so with all, that is, there's a tremendous amount of planning that goes into those operations. But of course, we're not the only people who are working in Antarctica to do science. So the National Foundation and the National Science Foundation is able to support research projects and doing everything from our telescopes observing the early universe to biologists who are studying life down in Antarctica to geologists who are studying the features down there, climate scientists um, looking for um, looking at various things about climate change. So really all of us and uh, lots of different types of science are being supported by this US Antarctic program. So then for the question about um, climate change and how this relates to the melting of ice caps. Um, so unfortunately travel and moving big amounts of stuff around isn't uh, very environmentally friendly. And of course, living when we're living in Antarctica, we do have a much bigger carbon footprint than if we're up in North America, because of course, we're not growing our food locally, everything's being transported using fossil fuels. Um, so that's, it's an unfortunate part of our work. But at the same time, um, as a small group of scientists with our relatively small experiments, we're actually really subdominant to the effects of sort of the rest of the world's population through just our, our normal standard activities. Um, so I would say that uh, our overall contributions to uh, sort of climate change or the melting of the ice caps are um, relatively small. And unfortunately, we won't be able to solve our climate crisis just by uh, stopping deploying stuff to Antarctica. Okay. Uh, we have another two questions that are somewhat related to each other. Uh, from Jerome Newell, um, if we had scopes in the northern hemisphere, would we expect similar or different measurements? 
And from Ken Coppersmith, would a space-based microwave telescope be feasible? Yeah, great. So um, from our space-based telescopes that we've had before, um, we have some measurements of the sky. Um, from when we're in space, we can see effectively both um, what we would see from the northern and southern hemisphere. And so um, we can tell actually, and an important principle of our cosmology is that we're not in a special place in the universe. And so when we're studying things on really large scales, it shouldn't matter too much where we look. So we really do expect um, the cosmology that we would measure from the Southern Hemisphere to be the same as the cosmology that we would measure from the Northern Hemisphere. And to the extent that we've been able to probe that by previous satellite missions, um, that seems to be true. But of course, we're also, we're measuring statistical processes here. We're measuring the statistics of the photons that we can see. And so something that you might know about statistics is that um, as you go to larger and larger sample sizes, you can do a better job with that measurement. So for instance, if you're trying to figure out like what an election result is going to be, the more people you ask, the better that you can predict that election result. And so as we're doing statistics on um, the properties of this cosmic microwave background, we would like to have as big of a sample as possible. And so we get that big sample if we can look at the full sky. So from that perspective, it is useful to have measurements um, of the full sky, either by combining data from Southern and Northern telescopes or from a satellite mission. And in fact, for tourists um, flying from a balloon uh, from New Zealand instead of Antarctica, we can see more sky from that balloon. And that's something that's really gonna help us in the science that we're trying to do with Taurus. So then to answer the question about future satellites, um, if we got funding for a future satellite mission, that would help us out and we could learn a lot that way. And the issue is just that um, it's a lot cheaper to have telescopes on the ground or on a balloon. And NASA only has so much funding for all of the different telescopes across the electromagnetic spectrum. So we have to kind of um, consider which, which wavelengths uh, for observing are the best use of our resources. And then we kind of trade off uh, what kind of telescope is gonna get built for the next big space mission. But I do hope sometime in the future, um, we might get another CMB satellite. And uh, a little bit also uh, related to those last two questions. Uh, this is from Jay Burns. What direction is the CMB coming from? And does this directional data tell you about the universe? Good, so the CMB, um, when we look into the sky, it's, it's coming from everywhere. And that's because just like there's not really a difference between when we look in the Northern and the Southern Hemisphere, um, we're not in a special place in the universe. Um, so when we look out, we're just seeing light that was coming from the early universe. That's, we're seeing the light that's coming towards us, but that's because that's by definition what we can see. Um, it's not because there's anything special about where we are. And so we're not seeing anything special there, but that's actually, that's good because it's letting us um, probe really fundamental things about the universe. So we're not being biased by our particular location. And now we've got some uh, really interesting uh, detector questions. From William Gray, what are the metals used for the superconductor detectors? Yeah, so there are lots of different metals that you can use. Um, and there are lots of different ones that work. Which ones people actually choose depends a little bit on the experience of the particular laboratory that's making the detectors and um, the particular uh, wavelength or the frequency of the microwave light that we're looking at, and also whether these detectors are going to be used on the ground or on a balloon. But in general, some common materials are um, aluminum or titanium, or we can also use um, alloys like aluminum manganese. And uh, now we have uh, a couple of questions dealing with uh, the properties of the light that you observe. Uh, from Ken Coppersmith, how do the telescopes differentiate between background light and ordinary starlight, for example? And from Anderson uh, Kalbfell, do you deal with troubles from quantum fluctuations in the light you observe? Good. Okay. So... Um, to address the first question there, so how we differentiate the light um, from the cosmic microwave background from other things. Um, so we're lucky in that there aren't a ton of really, really bright microwave sources across the sky. There are some, um, but a pretty, um, pretty key features of the cosmic microwave background are that we're not, we're not looking at any particular object. We're looking at something across the whole sky. And so 
Whereas if you were looking at something particular, like a star, um, there would be certain characteristic sizes that those objects might have. And so when we do see um, sort of microwave point sources that would also be in the maps, first of all, we very often know where those point sources are um, from other types of measurements. So we can uh, basically mask them out because we know that they're not part of the microwave background. And then we also, um, we know that we're not looking for any particular object. We're just looking at the entire background. So we do have to worry about things like our own galaxy, um, which for, from our perspective, it's so big that it doesn't look like a tiny point source in a particular location. It's just everywhere in all of the maps. But in that case, we can also use um, measurements of different frequencies of microwave light to figure out what's the background and what's the foreground. And that's just because um, those objects effectively have different temperatures, so they have different shapes as a function of frequency. And they're also the polarization, if we're interested in polarization, it's being generated by different physical mechanisms. So we can use all of that information to actually be able to distinguish between the different signals. Um, good, so then there was, there was the question about quantum fluctuations and whether we have to worry about those. So we do worry a lot about noise in our detectors um, and noise is part of what's driving us to keep our detectors so cold. Um, so we're not worried so much about quantum fluctuations in particular, but if we build really, really good detectors, um, then we'll be limited not by thermal fluctuations or by other types of noise within our own instrument, but will be limited by the number of CMB photons that we can see at any given time, because we do only have so many of them. So our signal is only so strong. Um, and so we'll have to just keep staring at it for longer and longer um, or with more sensors to be able to do more precise measurements. Yeah. Um, we have a question here from Brian Tamanaha. It sounds like you rely on theoretical assumptions to compensate for inefficiencies in measurements, are you also able to test for whether the theoretical assumptions themselves are correct or are theoretical assumptions simply accepted as true? Yeah, so I would say that um, in this case, we're using the measurements to be able to distinguish between different theories. So when we go into a measurement, um, we might have competing theories where we might have other observational evidence that would support all of those theories but then the current measurements that we have might not be able to help us tell them apart. And so as we're doing this, we're sort of um, building on other observations and combining all of our knowledge about the universe from different sources. And so in this case, uh, we actually, theorists are really creative. And so you can come up with all kinds of different theories about the universe, but it's really nice to be able to have something that will help you distinguish between the different theories. So in this case, we are, we're using our measurements both to um, help measure certain parameters or certain descriptions of the universe, whether that be like the mass of a certain particle or even how abundant certain types of things are in the universe. Um, but then we're also testing those theories to say whether say our models of the universe even need certain components or whether they would support the ideas that certain events must have occurred um, in the universe's history. Uh, related to this, we have a question from VJ Dixit. Could you have predicted existence of gravitational waves from the polarization studies of the CMB? Um, so the polarization signals from gravitational waves in the CMB are really, really small. So even though um, people have been looking for more than a decade now, no one's been able to detect one yet. Um, so we're still trying and we're able to, even when we don't detect them, we're able to actually constrain theories of the universe and say that theories need to have generated gravitational waves below a certain amplitude. But because we haven't seen them yet, we can't prove that they exist um, that way. So it's actually been very nice for us that experiments like LIGO have um, demonstrated that they exist because now we know we're looking for something that exists. Um, also related to that, Liliana Simone asks, does the CMB show local motion? Do you use Doppler on your data? Yeah, that's a really great question. So the CMB does show local motion. And in fact, when we show our pictures of the universe, like the map that I showed you, um, that map has been corrected for the local motion. So we can use the local motion a little bit um, as a calibration tool, but mostly when we're trying to study the universe, it's actually an effect that we take out of the data. 
Uh, going back to a detector question from uh, Anderson Kalbfeld, do you use YBCO superconductors to limit the amount of cold you need? Yeah, so as far as I know, that hasn't been used for a CMB telescope. And part of the reason for that is that um, in addition to needing to be cold so that our detectors will be superconducting, we also want to be cold so that we're minimizing the amount of noise that we're detecting just from thermal fluctuations because as things are warm, uh, they, you get random particle motions and those motions would contribute as um, noise in our uh, telescopes. So for instance, just to have superconducting detectors, we wouldn't need to cool our detectors all the way down to 0.1 Kelvin. As you're pointing out, there are much warmer temperature superconductors, but we keep trying to make our detectors colder and colder just so we can get rid of that noise. Um, so in that sense, warmer superconductors don't help us that much. Well, that seems to be the end of uh, the questions in the chat, and you've already done uh, on the order of 15, 20 minutes here of, of answering questions, and there have been some great questions uh, from the audience. So I think uh, we can wrap it up here, but just to remind people that next week we will have Professor James Mertens, um, who will be presenting some of the theoretical background uh, for what you've heard today, so you'll be able to have a chance to uh, discuss this a bit more next week. So let's thank uh, Joanna again for a great talk and uh, hopefully we'll see you all next week. Great. Thanks, Mike. And thanks everyone for um, joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, they're all you very, very welcome. Appreciate it. Thank you, Thanks. Joanna. It was very nice. It's an amazing comeback. You know, they ask a little